So good morning, good morning, and welcome to this Honest Israel Bethel Meet the Author event. Some of you belong to those two synagogues, and some of you are from the wider community of book lovers. All of you are very welcome. I'm Robin Jacobson, the librarian at Addis Israel in DC. I also co-facilitate Bethel's book club in Bethesda, Maryland, together with Marge London. Marge will be with you in a moment. Today, we are happy and honored to welcome from Boston, Jonathan Kaufman, the author of The Last Kings of Shanghai, the rival Jewish dynasties that helped create modern China. This is a fascinating book about two Baghdadi Jewish families, about Chinese and world history, about capitalism and communism, about the Jews who sheltered in Shanghai during World War II, and so much more. We're grateful to Janina Duker for introducing us to Jonathan and to him for joining us. In honor of Jonathan's visit, I have a Shanghai Zoom background today, and Marge does too. We're hoping that seeing that background gives you at least the illusion of foreign travel, even if we're all sheltering at home. Before Marge introduces Jonathan and launches today's program, I'll share with you a quick preview of coming attractions, which will be listed in the chat box with registration links. Even more important, the chat box will contain the links to purchase Jonathan's wonderful book, Politics and Prose, our local independent bookstore is offering a 10% discount, and there are also links to other sellers. Okay, coming attraction. So next month on Sunday, February 7th at 11 a.m., we will discuss the Israeli novel, The Tunnel, by A.B. Yehoshua, translated into English by Stuart Schaffman. We are thrilled to announce that Stuart Schaffman himself will actually be joining us to share his perspective on the tunnel. Our thanks to Rachel Greenberg for arranging Stuart Schaffman's visit. Then in March, on Sunday, March 14th at 11 a.m., we'll welcome David Byspiel, who will introduce his exceptional memoir about growing up Jewish in Texas called A Place of Exodus. Next up on April 18th, we'll discuss Cast, a powerful new work of social history by Isabel Wilkerson, and then on June 6, we'll welcome the much loved historical novelist, Geraldine Brooks. Again, all these events are listed in the chat box along with the registration links. The way we'll proceed now is that Marge will introduce Jonathan, then we'll see a terrific two minute video about Last Kings, then Jonathan will talk to us about his book. We're all looking forward to that. And then we'll have a Q&A period in which you can ask Jonathan questions. I'll explain about that later. Although most of this program is being recorded, the Q&A period will not be recorded. You can also put questions for Jonathan in the chat box while he's speaking, and then we'll turn to them after he's finished speaking. And now Marge will introduce Jonathan Kaufman. It's an honor to host Jonathan Kaufman today. He is a distinguished and celebrated reporter, editor, and author who is currently the director of the School of Journalism at Northeastern University in Boston. Prior to joining Northeastern University, he held a senior position at Bloomberg News, The Wall Street Journal, and The Boston Globe. His journalism career began at the Boston Globe in the early 1980s when he won a Pulitzer Prize as part of a team examining racism and job discrimination in Boston. He also served as Berlin bureau chief for the Boston Globe. In addition to being a journalist, Jonathan Kaufman is also the author of three books, including The Last King of Shanghai. His two previous books are A Hole in the Heart of the World, Being Jewish in Eastern Europe, and Broken Alliance, The Turbulent Times Between Black Jews in America, which won a National Jewish Book Award. Jonathan is a graduate of both Yale and Harvard University, receiving his BA in English from Yale and an MA in Regional Studies East Asia from Harvard. 
We are delighted to have him with us today. Before Jonathan speaks, he asks that we show a brief two-minute video to give you a flavor of Old Shanghai and introduce you to some of the important people in this book. Shanghai, 1936. The Cathay Hotel, located on the city's famous waterfront, is one of the most glamorous in the world. Built by Victor Sassoon, billionaire playboy and head of the Sassoon dynasty, the hotel hosts a virtual who's who of global celebrities. Noel Coward, Charlie Chaplin, Wallace Simpson. Meantime, just a few miles away, Mao and the nascent Communist Party have been plotting revolution before being forced to flee the city. By the 1930s, the Sassoons had been doing business in China for a century, rivaled in wealth and influence by only one other dynasty, the Kadoris. These two Jewish families, both originally from Baghdad, stood astride Chinese business and politics for more than 175 years. In The Last Kings of Shanghai, Jonathan Kaufman tells the remarkable story of how the men and women in these families opened China to the world, yet remained blind to the political turmoil on their doorsteps. He tells the triumphant story of how they joined forces to rescue and protect 18,000 Jewish refugees fleeing the Nazis. It is a story of opium smuggling, family rivalry, political intrigue, survival, and the rise of China. And it is all true. What wonderful vintage photos in that video, a perfect introduction. Please go ahead, Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you all, uh, all joining me uh, after a chaotic week that probably in some ways rivaled what it must have been like in Shanghai uh, in the 1949 when the communists were, were encircling the city. Um, but I appreciate you all zooming in um, and give me a chance to talk with you a little bit about my book. Um, you know, I'm a journalist, and so journalists tend to kind of stumble upon topics. We don't necessarily research them in libraries. We kind of encounter them and then have a series of questions we want to answer. So my own interest in this book really started way back in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when China was just opening up. I was a young journalist. It was my first foreign assignment um, over in China. And um, China, you have to remember back then, was a very different country than it is now. Uh, Mao had died uh, only recently. Uh, everybody wore those blue Mao suits. Um, there were far more bicycles than there were cars. Um, it really was a, a black and white movie rather than, uh, rather than one, uh, one in color, rather with the vibrancy that we see now. Um, are we, is everyone muted? We're getting some feedback from um, Let's see if I can take care of that. Yeah, I think that's better. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Now okay, that's okay. Let me try that now. Okay. Okay, so I'm unmuted now. Robin, can everyone hear me now? Good, okay. Um, so um, I was in Shanghai uh, as a reporter and I was walking along the Bund, which is that beautiful um, uh, uh, skyline that, that is in Robin's background um, that you saw at the beginning. And I was walking along the Bund and I had to use the bathroom. And so I stepped into a, a, a hotel, uh, the Peace Hotel, and um, asked the bellhop there um, if there was a bathroom that I could use. And it was like stepping into a 1930s movie set. 
the floors were marble, the, the, um, there were stained glass windows, um, everything was very ornate and Art Deco style from the 1920s. And the bellhop that I went up to was dressed in white with a little white cap. And when I asked him in English if there was a bathroom that I could use, he responded to me in French. And so I, I left there trying to figure out what was this kind of 1930s artifact doing in the middle of Shanghai, in the middle of red China, um, when everything else was so drab and, and dreary. And then uh, later on, in another trip I took to China, to Shanghai, um, there were these minders that would accompany reporters everywhere to make sure you, you know, didn't get into trouble and didn't ask questions they didn't want asked. And so one of these minders said he was going to take me to the children's palace, he called it, which was a place where uh, Chinese children took music lessons in Shanghai or ballet lessons, things like that. So I said, sure, I'd be happy to go. It would probably be a nice little feature story that I could do. And so um, we got there. And again, it was this incongruous place. It was like an English country house set in a park in the middle of Shanghai. Um, and we went inside and the, the ballroom was magnificent. It was the size of a football field. And there were these ornate bedrooms everywhere and these grand staircases. And in every room, there were these classes set up for Chinese children, but this clearly had at one point been the home of a tremendously wealthy family. And as I was living, there was a, as I was leaving, there was a small plaque um, on, the, uh, uh, on the entryway that said this had once been the home of the Kaduris. Well, pieces began to fit together a little bit because I knew the Kaduri name because I was based in Hong Kong and um, the Kaduris were a very wealthy Jewish family, one of the richest families in, in Hong Kong, one of the most powerful families there. Uh, but I hadn't realized that they had once lived in Shanghai. In the same way, someone told me that the cafe hotel where I'd used the bathroom uh, had been built by Victor Sassoon. Uh, a Jewish billionaire who had lived in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s. But now, of course, there was no trace of, of either of these families in Shanghai, except for these beautiful buildings that they had, that they had built. Um, once I moved to China as a foreign correspondent and lived there with my family, um, we always loved going to Shanghai because it was a fun place to visit. The kids really loved it. And one weekend, we were exploring the city, and we went to a poorer part of the city uh, called Hankyu. And when we got there, we were walking, exploring the alleyways. And I noticed on the alleyways in many of the tenement buildings that were there that were you know, filled with Chinese families and people walking around and children playing, that there were the shadows of mezuzahs on the doorposts of many of these homes. And again, I couldn't quite figure out what would, what would shadows of mezuzahs be doing here in Shanghai. And of course, as I discovered, these were left by the um, refugees, the 18,000 Jewish refugees who came from Berlin and Vienna fleeing uh, the rise of Hitler, who had been given sanctuary in Shanghai and had actually lived in this, in this neighborhood. So kind of based on these encounters, I, 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 my curiosity was piqued and I wanted to figure out what was the history here? What was the story behind what I was seeing? Um, and the story, it turned out, starts in Baghdad. You know, I think many of us, when we look at our own background, when we, you know, talk about our families, you know, we know the story of Fiddler on the Roof, which is, um, you know, Jews who grow up in, in poor ghettos uh, in Europe or in the United States, um, and then they rise to great prominence. But the story of Baghdad was different. Um, the Jews in Baghdad, we really read about in the Bible, there's that famous psalm how by the waters of Babylon we wept when we remembered Zion. Baghdad was Babylon. This was the place where after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar took groups of Jews uh, to Babylon, um, which later became known as Baghdad. And, and the Jews in Baghdad, while they may have been weeping um, and, and remembering Jerusalem, actually uh, were incredibly successful and had an incredibly rich culture uh, and civilization that they built in Baghdad. Um, they, uh, they became very well-respected merchants. Um, they developed all sorts of study of the Talmud. And they became so influential that, in fact, the rulers of Baghdad, whether they were Turks or Ottomans or, or whoever, um, relied on them uh, to help govern the country and to expand their trading routes. 
Um, and in order to make dealing with the Jews easier, they would name one family, the most prominent Jewish family, uh, to sort of be in charge of the Jewish community, but also to be an advisor to the Pasha, the king, whoever was ruling Baghdad at the time. And when this this uh, leader of the Jewish community was brought to meet with the king, he would be carried in a sedan chair through the streets of Baghdad, and everybody, Jew and non-Jew alike, would bow their heads in respect as he passed by. So this family, these leaders of the Jewish community carried through the streets of Baghdad, like royalty really, were the Sassoons, the Sassoon family. Um, uh, they were extremely wealthy, very well learned, um, and um, were uh, in, in a business sense, um, were probably some of the best um, businessmen uh, in Baghdad and in the Middle East at the time. But as often happens in Jewish history, politics turned against the Jews. And by the 1820s, 1830s, um, many wealthy Jews in Baghdad were being kidnapped by the government and held for ransom so that they could kind of raise money from them for their other, their other endeavors. And David Sassoon, was in his 30s, was about to take over the family business, the family empire, really. And um, he was jailed um, by the rulers of Baghdad and being held for ransom. His father went down and ransomed him out of prison. But he realized that this was just the beginning, that things were going to enter a very bad time for the Jews. And so he took David down to the waterfront, put him on a boat um, that he had secured, and sent him off uh, to safety. Um, but before he left, he draped him with a cloak um, that was had the inside was sewed with pearls. Um, so he would have something to start with when he started his new life. So David Sassoon, who had thought he was going to be taking over this kind of royal family and this huge business dynasty, ends up spending his first couple of nights um, uh, uh, leaving Baghdad, sleeping on the floor of a warehouse uh, with a gun to protect himself and to shoot at the rats that were skittering by. And so I think one way to look at this story is not as kind of the fiddler on the roof story that we're familiar with, but it's almost Shakespearean. It's, it's the story of an of a, of a almost royal family that loses everything and basically battles back over the next century and a half to reclaim the prominence that was, that was once theirs. So David Sassoon um, leaves Baghdad um, and he makes his way to India. Uh, right at the time when the British Empire is expanding. This is now the 1830s. The British Empire has lost the revolution here in the US, but they're expanding everywhere else uh, around the world. And um, they are about to conquer India. And David Sassoon arrives and realizes that there's great business opportunity in India. He's already very skilled. He speaks many languages. He's used to you know, running a global business dynasty, having grown up in the Sassoon family. And so he begins to do business uh, in India, uh, successfully uh, 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 extracts the rest of his family to join him. And uh, within a few years is a millionaire um, and is becoming very prominent in India because the British government as it conquered India and as it expanded realized that they needed outsiders, including Jews, um, to help push British trade and, and kind of push the sort of British economic influence throughout Asia. So around the same time, uh, Britain is looking at China and really wants to break into the Chinese market. And the, the center of the British interest in China is opium. Um, British firms are selling opium to China, but China, it's illegal to have opium, so they're smuggling it in and then selling it to people once they get there. The Chinese empire is resisting this, they're uh, arresting British soldiers, and the British finally decide to invade China. These are the opium wars that take place in the 1830s. Britain invades China, and its goal is really to open up the Chinese market. And so when they defeat China in two wars, what they demand is that all these cities in China be opened up to Western trade, including the opium trade. Uh, Shanghai is one of these cities, along with uh, Canton, which is now known as Guangzhou, and Hong Kong, a number of, of all these cities become open to Western businesses. And David Sassoon looks at this and thinks, this is a great business opportunity. He had already begun uh, uh, dabbling in the opium trade when he was in India, and um, and now um, saw the great possibilities that were that were available in um, uh, in China. 
Now we can talk later about the moral issues here, which I think are very serious, but I don't wanna sugarcoat it. Um, the Sassoons made their fortune um, selling opium to the Chinese. This was the foundation of it. And the morality of it is something that I think the family has had to live with ever since, the way other British firms did as well. But what was interesting about the Sassoons at the time was that they were very innovative and entrepreneurial. I think of China back then almost as if it were like the Silicon Valley um, of the world. This was a place where very young men, they were usually men, could go and, um, and have a great adventure, but also make a lot of money very quickly. Um, you know, David Sassoon had eight sons and he would take these eight sons and he basically sent them all across China. Most of them were in their early 20s. They left their families behind in India and they would set up these outposts where they could um, start the opium trade, other kinds of trading, and they would stay in touch with each other. Um, one of the things the Sassoons did that was very innovative was they relied on the telegraph. The telegraph was a very new invention at the time. And the Sassoons realized that they could stay in touch with each other, brothers with brothers, with their father back in Bombay, and keep him apprised of the latest price of opium or good business deals that were to be had. The Sassoons also invested in steamships, which meant that they could get the opium from India to China faster than a lot of their competitors. So as a result, um, by 1870, the Sassoons have completely taken over the opium trade. They've driven out all the other British rivals. And in fact, when I went through a lot of the business records of their rivals, you see the anti-Semitism among the British who were very upset that these, you know, Jew these Jews from Baghdad were suddenly making all this money and taking over the opium trade. Um, but the Sassoons were able to, to, in a business sense, um, you know, become very entrepreneurial, very innovative, and, and start, to build, um, start to build their huge fortune. Um, and they, the, the patriarch, David Sassoon, recognizes that key to having a global business dynasty is having offices in London and Shanghai, as well as in Bombay. And so he takes these, his eight sons, and then they begin to travel all around the world. They go to London and they become friendly with the British royal family. They send their children to Oxford and to Eton. Um, they buy these beautiful country houses in, um, uh, in, uh, 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 outside of London. They begin to entertain the Prince of Wales. They become very influential in British society. Now, one of the things that's interesting in this period, I wanna talk a little bit about the role of women in all this, because the role of women in these families and really in history is often, we don't pay much attention to it. Not very much is known about these women. It's always considered, well, they were at home with the children. But in these families, the women played a very important, uh, very important role. Um, the other family I write about, the Kaduri family, um, had followed a similar trajectory. Eli Kaduri, while not as grand a family as the Sassoons, um, had left Baghdad uh, to work for the Sassoons. Um, the Sassoons needed young, ambitious men um, who they trusted to run a lot of their offices in China. Eli Kaduri was only 15 years old uh, when his mother sent him to Bombay to work for the Sassoons. He was 18 years old when he landed in China. And just imagine what it's like to be 18 years old, to not speak the language, and suddenly you have this vast country that you're trying to understand and do business in. But Eli Kaduri was extremely successful. He became a millionaire very quickly, broke off on his own, started his own company, started his own investments, and then it became time for him to find a wife. So as many you know, ambitious young men did, he sailed to England uh, to try to find someone to marry and met a very prominent uh, woman, Laura Kaduri, Laura Makata, she was known at the time, uh, who was the daughter of a very prominent British Jewish family. Um, this was a family that had been in England for a number of years. They were very wealthy um, and, and had a great deal of social status. So um, Laura and Ellie marry in London. And typically what would have happened was that Ellie would have gone back to China, made his fortune, uh, and then left Laura back in London with the children uh, to raise, and, and he would come back for visits. But Laura Kaduri was a very unusual woman for her time. She was very adventurous. Uh, she was actually older than Ellie. Um, and, and she basically said, uh, I'm gonna travel with you. I'm gonna go with you back to China. And so the two of them sail back to China. They land in Hong Kong. 
Um, she has two children very quickly and then decides that she's going to accompany her husband as he's traveling throughout China doing his business deals. And even more remarkably, she keeps a diary during this time. And her diary reads a little bit like, you know, Catherine Hepburn in the African Queen. She's sailing up these rivers. She's seeing this terrible poverty in China in the cities. She's seeing warships as war is breaking out in different parts of China at different times. I mean, she's traveling with servants. She's a well-born British woman, but she's having a sort of a series of encounters with China that are, are really unparalleled, that, that no one else can really match. And, and I think it's important because in some ways she becomes the conscience of the Kaduri family. One of the things she sees as her husband is doing these business deals, she sees the terrible poverty of the Chinese. Um, she sees the way in which different countries are invading China all the time, the US, Britain, uh, Germany and others and carving it up. And she decides that one of the problems in China is that the girls are not educated. And she starts encouraging her husband to set up schools for Chinese girls. Now, this is remarkable. This is in the early 1900s, um, when the whole idea of, of, of philanthropy like this was really unheard of in a place like China. Um, but the Kaduri starts setting up these schools for girls throughout the country um, because Laura believes that, that educating girls is going to improve the life of, of all Chinese. Um, she eventually settles in Shanghai with her husband. They move into a mansion, um, not the mansion that I went to, a, a different one. Um, and um, there's a fire that takes place in the mansion. And um, Laura runs out uh, to escape the flames. But when she's outside, she thinks that the Chinese nanny who's taking care of the boys, her two boys, is still trapped inside. So she runs back inside to rescue the nanny. Um, as it turned out, the nanny had gotten out through another exit. Uh, Laura gets lost in the smoke. She stumbles around and she dies um, in, the, um, uh, in the fire. And this is obviously a tragedy for the Kaduri family, but it's something the Chinese are just really struck by. The idea that a, a rich British woman would run into a fire to save a Chinese servant um, is, is something that's really remarkable to them and something the Chinese still talk about today when you talk to them. It's a story that's been told over and over again. But I think it gives an insight into the way in which, you know, this woman um, really played an important role in, in, in both in China's history, but also in shaping the values of, of the family. I think it's something that we kind of know intuitively from our own families in the role of women, but I think is interesting to see in, in, in this family and this history. Now, another story that kind of ends very differently is in the Sassoon family. As I said, David Sassoon had eight sons, and he sends these eight sons all around the world um, to run his business. Most of them go to London. And as they, they go to London, they basically love the life there. Um, they're hobnobbing with uh, the Prince of Wales. They're going to these parties. And no one's really paying attention to the business back in Shanghai, back in Bombay, that's producing all the money to fund all these lavish parties and, and buy all these properties. And so at one point, the remaining brother who's left uh, in Asia dies prematurely. And there's some question about who's going to take over the business operations of this dynasty because all the other brothers are having a, a, a grand old time in London. And so Flora Sassoon, uh, who was married to, um, to the brother who died prematurely, says, look, I'll take over the business for a few years until our son comes of age and can take things over. And so her brothers-in-law figure, well, that's OK. You know, she's a woman. It'll be she'll be a figurehead. Um, but it turns out Flora Sassoon is an extremely astute businesswoman. Um, she speaks several languages. She's extremely smart. And she basically begins to run the company um, very effectively. And this is at a time when not only women couldn't, didn't have the right to vote, but women in India lived behind what was called purda, which meant they literally could not be seen in public. Uh, Flora Sassoon couldn't go to the Sassoon offices. She couldn't visit uh, factories the Sassoons owned. She basically began to run this entire global empire from her living room. 
But over time, she actually becomes more courageous and she steps out more. She visits offices. It creates these scandals when she appears in public because she is running the company. And then in a situation much like ours today, a plague breaks out in India, in Bombay, um, the bubonic plague. And it's spreading so wildly and there's so much fear about it that uh, the Indian workers who work for the Sassoons are afraid to come to work and factories are having to close down. And so Flora Sassoon uh, decides to look for a cure and for a vaccine. And so she brings over scientists from Europe, they study the plague, they come up with a vaccine. And then Flora Sassoon insists on being inoculated with the vaccine in public and having it photographed so that her Indian workers will realize that this vaccine is safe, they should take it, and that they can come back to work. So um, as I say, she's, she's very successful as a businesswoman, but the brothers-in-law start becoming jealous and they're worried that she won't really give up power uh, when it comes time for her son to take over. They don't like all the attention she's getting. And so they basically oust her in a boardroom coup. They do some business maneuvering and they basically kick her um, out of the company. Um, she ends up moving to London. She becomes a very well-known philanthropist and Jewish scholar, um, but her business career is essentially over. As somebody said to me, she kind of hit the bamboo ceiling. Um, and I think this is something that, you know, many of these women faced, which was even though they were very talented and, and valuable in these families, their, their possibilities were limited by, you know, by, uh, by a lot of the, the traditions um, and the jealousies of the, of the time. Um, so, as I said, the Sassoons are facing this problem where they're spending a lot of money in London. Um, but there's really no one to sort of make it and watch the making of it um, in, in Bombay uh, and in Shanghai. Um, but then along comes Victor Sassoon. Uh, in the pictures that you saw at the beginning, Victor Sassoon is the kind of rakish guy surrounded by the three chorus girls. Um, Victor Sassoon grew up in London, uh, went to Cambridge, and really loved to party. He was always seen with a chorus girl on each arm. He had an incredible wine cellar, even as a college student. And all the Sassoons assumed that he would be one of those Sassoons who basically spent the money in London and, and that was it. But he's injured during World War I. He's in, a, he's in a, a, an airplane accident and uh, loses the use of his legs. And he's, he decides that he'll never be able to live the kind of grand life he would like in London. And so he decides to move to Bombay and Shanghai um, uh, to see if, try his hand at business. Um, he turns out to be an incredibly brilliant businessman. And he makes the decision to move all the Sassoon fortunes to Shanghai and to build the Cafe Hotel, that, that hotel that I first went into when I first visited Shanghai. And that's in the background of, the, of, uh, of Robin's uh, picture and Marjorie's picture that you saw at the beginning. Um, this hotel was the fanciest hotel uh, in all of Asia. Um, Victor Sassoon brought in um, chefs from France. He brought in hotel managers from Vienna. Um, he created these beautiful suites um, with, um, with incredible fixtures. Um, and he really put Shanghai on the map. Charlie Chaplin comes to Shanghai to stay at his hotel. Noel Coward writes private lies while staying at his hotel. The way we all now are kind of talking about what our first trip is gonna be, after the pandemic ends, if we were living in the 1920s or 1930s, Shanghai would be on the top of our list. It was a place that you know, had a sense of, it was exotic, um, it was luxurious because you could now stay in Victor Sassoon's hotel, but it was also a little naughty. When I got to visit the uh, Cafe Hotel, now called the Peace Hotel, when I was researching the book, I went to Victor Sassoon's suite. He built a suite at the top of the hotel, overlooking the Bund, overlooking Shanghai. And so they were taking me around it and we went into the bathroom and there were two bathtubs in the bathroom. And so I said to the Chinese fellow who was taking me around, I said, what, what are these two bathtubs doing here? And he looked at me and he said, well, Sir Victor Sassoon always said he didn't mind sharing his bed, but he didn't like sharing his bath. So that gives you a sense of what it was like to be Victor Sassoon uh, in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s. He would have these extravagant parties where costume parties where he would dress up 
uh, as the ringmaster and everyone had to dress up as as um, as uh, circus acts. He would be the headmaster and guests would have to dress up as, as pupils. Um, he, he just had an incredible life of, of affairs, but also making a huge amount of money and probably was the sixth richest man in the world from all of his investments um, in, uh, in Shanghai. By the late 1930s, 1938, 39, these cruise ships that are showing up that before were bringing Charlie Chaplin and Noel Coward, Wallace Simpson, um, uh, who ends up marrying um, uh, uh, the king and making him leave his throne um, comes. Uh, but those ships start bringing a different kind of uh, a person, which are Jewish refugees. As we know, by the late 30s, Hitler is risen and Jews are desperate to get out of Germany and Austria, especially Berlin and Vienna. And most countries have shut their doors, including the United States, and there's no place for these Jews to go. Um, but because Shanghai was occupied in part by the British, in part by the Americans, in part by the Japanese, in part by um, all these different countries, the French and others, there was no visa requirement. If you got to Shanghai, you could, you could stay there. And so word gets to the refugees, these, these terrified Jews uh, in Germany and Austria, that if they make it to Shanghai, they'll be safe. And so many Jews, uh, middle-class Jews, upper middle-class Jews sell everything they have um, and they book passage on these cruise ships to take them to Shanghai. And 18,000 of them um, uh, make it there. Now, again, imagine what this is like. These are Jews who they don't speak Chinese. They've heard of Shanghai maybe, but they're just kind of overwhelmed by what they, by what, by what they see. And Victor Sassoon and the Kaduri family both step forward and begin to help these refugees. Victor Sassoon owns a lot of property. He opens up a lot of his buildings um, to, um, to many of these refugees um, to stay there. Um, but he also kind of does a con game on the Japanese. The Japanese have encircled the city. It's before Pearl Harbor. The Japanese are gradually conquering China, but they haven't taken Shanghai yet. And they have an anti-Semitic colonel uh, who is in charge of the Jewish problem. And Victor Sassoon begins to meet with him and basically persuades him that, you know, he will use his influence um, to maybe invest in Japan. Um, maybe he'll um, speak with Churchill and others uh, to keep uh, Britain and the U.S. out of the war. Jonathan, there was some background, yeah. so I muted you. Can you unmute? Yeah, Sorry. I'm on. I'm, okay, let me unmute. Sorry about that. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Um, and so uh, Victor Sassoon persuades this anti-Semitic Japanese captain to allow the Jews to continue to arrive. Um, and at the same time, he's spying on the Japanese. He actually flies to South America to try to buy property, land where these Jews can be resettled. Um, so he's trying to charm the Japanese, but also protect the Jews at the same time. Um, as a result of this, um, the 18,000 Jews who arrive in, in Shanghai during this time, none of them are killed by the Japanese. Even when the Germans send people to, um, uh, uh, to Shanghai, members of the Gestapo, and the members of the Gestapo say to the, the, the Japanese, you have these Jews living here, um, we can just... Um, uh, you know, load them onto ships, drag them into the middle of the harbor and sink them. And that way you can, uh, you can murder all these Jews. But the Japanese don't do it in part because they've been persuaded by Victor Sassoon um, that, that these Jews need to be, need to be protected. Um, so it's really a remarkable story of, of a way in which it's kind of like the Schindler's List story of, uh, of what, happens in, what happens in China. Well, after World War II ends, um, the, um, the Sassoons and the Kaduris returned to Shanghai. Victor Sassoon had to flee because the Japanese finally caught on to him, but he comes back. The Kaduris had not gotten out in time. They had actually been imprisoned by the Japanese. Uh, their father, Eli Kaduri, the patriarch, had died, but the two boys come back. Um, but of course, as it turns out, this is just an interlude because the communists are, are, are advancing now. And while the Kaduris and the Sassoons were very good businessmen, they turned out not to be very astute politically. And um, they don't realize what's about to happen with the communist takeover and they lose almost everything. 
Um, the Sassoons are, are most of their money at that point, uh, most of their money is in property. And so Victor Sassoon leaves Shanghai. He has a return ticket, but he never goes back. Um, and he becomes very bitter afterwards. The Kaduris are a bit smarter. They had moved some money to Hong Kong, which was a British colony, and they were able to move down there. And they have rebuilt their fortune bigger than ever. A, a part of the book, which I can talk about if you're interested, during the question period takes place in Hong Kong. And the Kaduris become very influential in rebuilding Hong Kong and, and guiding it through um, its incredible growth and success. And they now live in Hong Kong. They're the richest Western family in China. And like everyone, they're very nervous about all the changes that are happening um, in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, but I think I'll stop there with kind of the communist takeover of China, because that's where, in some ways, um, the story takes a break as well before it resumes in Hong Kong. And I'll be happy to take any of your questions. I don't know, Robin or Marjorie, if you want to ask questions in the chat or call on people, um, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions people have. Thank you, Jonathan. That was um, so informative and so illuminating and you're such a great storyteller.